Hello. How are you? How are you? It's like a rhetorical question, you know. My name is Andrew, like Catherine said. Uh, I'm a pastor in Denver, Colorado. Bloom Church is the church where uh, I pastor. And uh, I'm excited to be here, excited to be uh, part of this conference that's taking place this weekend. And uh, really excited to be in chapel. I actually got to speak in chapel about six years or so ago. I think I did a spiritual life week. Do you guys still do spiritual life week around here? So that was fun. Uh, I'm grateful that one of your guys here on staff, Jonathan, emailed me this week and he said, hey, uh, Pastor Arndt, we're really excited to have you at chapel. Uh, What's your sermon title and topic and text and all of that? And I looked at it over and over. I kept thinking, he has to have gotten something wrong here. I'm doing the conference. I don't think I got chapel. And so I dug back through some emails and sure enough, I'm doing chapel. And so I'm here. Now, fortunately, we preachers preach a lot. And so I've got some stuff that I can say. Whether you know it... (laughs) Whether you know it or not, uh, Easter in the church calendar is not just a moment that happens and then we like move on with the rest of our lives. Do you know that? Easter's like a season because new creation, when it comes into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, it doesn't just sort of erupt and then we go on our merry way, but it's this thing that dawns and we have to learn how to live into it. And so part of what I love about the church calendar is that it teaches us to sort of tease out gently the ways in which this new creation is supposed to take root in us. So what I want to do this morning is read a resurrection text and uh, make a couple comments to you about it, and then we'll all be on our merry way. This is Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Then the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just like he said. So come and see the place where he lay. And then go, quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. Everybody say, into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb. Afraid, and yet full of joy. I love that comment. And they ran to tell his disciples, and then suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. Sort of a funny thing, the resurrected Jesus. Greetings. (laughs) The Bible is funny that way. Greetings, he said, and they came to him, clasped his feet. I mean, what do you say after you've come back from the dead? (laughs) Hello. Anyway, he clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. Everybody say, to Galilee. And there they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's take a moment and pray. Almighty God, you are first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and you also call yourself the all in all, and so you are here. With the fullness of your presence, you are here. You surround us on every side. You are closer to us than our very breath. Uh, You're present, and you're making us alive by the power of your Son's resurrection. We don't really know fully what it means to live in the power of the resurrection, but we're hoping to make a start. So we ask, God, that as we gather here around this old story, this sacred text, that you'd open our hearts and open our minds and help us see something of the dimension of resurrection that we've not seen before. Come and take up deeper residence in us. 
and lead us more deeply into your own heart. Help us make our residence, God, in you, we ask. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. Every year, the church enters into its liturgical cycle. So we start with Advent. We celebrate the coming of God into the world in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And there's hope and wonder and joy and expectation. The light dawns for the first time. And then somewhere around January and February, we enter into the season known as Epiphany, where we learn to begin to live with the light. And the church and the church calendar will start reading stories of the ministry of Jesus, some of the things that he did while he walked on this earth. Uh, It'll start reading things about the teaching of Jesus, what he taught. Uh, The disciples get involved with Jesus at this point. And so the light has come into the world, but now these people, these disciples, have sort of involved themselves with Jesus, and that's what we're supposed to do. We begin to involve ourselves with Jesus, and we find that the simplicity of that first moment where we met him during Advent, the light of the world dawns upon us, that it's actually a little bit more complex than we ever thought it was. And so we start following Jesus, and we start obeying Jesus, and we start throwing ourselves into it, and all of a sudden there are twists, and there are turns, and The plot goes in really interesting directions, and stuff will fall apart. We experience fallings apart of various kinds, you know? And so we're journeying with Jesus, and then we hit Lent, and the story pivots to the cross, and we realize that this story was never going to be as awesome as we thought it was going to be. We just thought that the light would come, and this is nice, and it makes us feel good, and we're going to go on with our lives, and no, like, it's more complicated than that. And so we pour ourselves into the story with Jesus, and we find that he's dead set on going to Jerusalem, And we get to Jerusalem on Good Friday, and all of our hopes and dreams and expectations are dashed. I mean, the whole thing that started so beautifully and simply in Advent, all of a sudden, by the time Good Friday hits, the thing has just, like, the wheels have come off, man. Like, it's totally fallen apart. And then you have this moment. Easter. The call goes out in great simplicity and beauty. Christ is risen. And we all respond, he is risen indeed. And all of a sudden we come back to it, the simplicity of it. And we begin to work our way through the whole story again. I think that there's something in this of the spiritual journey. The resurrected Christ, when he comes back from the dead, he meets these women and he tells them, go and tell my brothers to meet me in Galilee. That's where they're going to see me. Do you know where Galilee is? Galilee is where they first met Jesus. It's interesting to me that the resurrected Christ, after all of the drama of his life, the drama of the last three years, the drama of Holy Week, he comes back from the dead, and the thing that he wants to do with them is he wants to take them back all the way to the beginning. Meet me in Galilee, to the place where they first met him, to the place where they first heard his call, to the place where they first fell in love with him. And they work it out from there. Now, I actually think that this is a really apt metaphor for the spiritual journey. I can remember experiencing Jesus for the first time. Uh, I grew up in church. And so uh, I don't, like, I don't really have, uh, a lot of people will have, like, what they call their spiritual birthday or whatever. So it's like the moment when they gave their lives to the Lord for the first time and they can put their finger on a calendar and that's when it happened. For me, uh, it didn't happen like that. And so for me, I've always sort of known, like, the reality of God in Christ. That's always been very present to me. And so I always knew God. I always knew Jesus. I always had this sort of uh, provisional knowledge of who he was. But I remember when I experienced Jesus deeply for the first time. I was in high school. I was going to a private Christian high school. And uh, uh, the guy who was, like, sort of the headmaster of the school, it was a smaller school, was this really, really zealous guy. Uh, and was zealous for revival and for all these amazing things to happen in our school and tended to, because of his zealousness for his stuff that he cared about, he tended to become a little bit legalistic at times and so put a lot of undue pressure on us and this, that, and the other thing. And I just remember being really frustrated with him and being frustrated with the situation. And one morning early before school, I was kneeling by my bedside and I was reading the scripture and I came uh, to 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. You know, love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, it's not proud. And as I'm reading this love chapter, I remember hearing God say really deep in my spirit, uh, Andrew, you know, when the Bible talks about me, it really only uses 
one word to describe the core, the essence of my personality, what I'm like. And it doesn't say I'm revival or signs and wonders or all this other stuff. When the Bible uses anything to describe me, it says I am love. God is love. There are lots of other attributes that God has, but like love in the scripture is the essence of God's character. It is the rock, solid, hard core essence of who God is. And I remember hearing that in my soul. And then at that same moment of hearing that, I felt the presence of God in a way that I've, I'd never felt the presence of God before. I'd had lots of moments where I knew about God and sort of that little tingling sensation you have, God is near. But this was like a flood of God's love, a flood of God's goodness, a flood of God's presence. And intuitively, I knew that that feeling of the love of God was the person of Jesus Christ. Like, I just knew that. And it's funny because theologians sometimes will talk about uh, the love of God. Paul has this great thing that he says where he says that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he's given us. And the theologians will debate. So when it says the love of God has been poured out, does that mean God's love for us? Or does it mean our love for God? And when you experience it, you know that there's really not a line between those two things. That in that same moment of experiencing the love of God, you also experience yourself loving God. That reflex in you, that wants to give everything to God, it comes awake in that moment of feeling God. And since that moment, I've had, like the journey has taken so many twists and turns. It was a moment of profound and utter simplicity. It was meeting Jesus in Galilee. And the journey's taken so many twists and turns. I've learned a lot of stuff. I've had my theology at various times blown to smithereens and then sort of reframed. You know, I've had, I've experienced loss. I've experienced defeat in my own life, incredible discouragement and depression. I've experienced all of this stuff. And yet what I've found is that as I follow Jesus in the journey, and we've taken great risks together as a family to try to do things for Jesus, and what I've experienced is that God will ask me to do stuff. He will lead me out on the journey, and then somehow always he'll bring me back. He brings me back to the simplicity of my original faith. He brings me back to the simplicity of my original trust in Jesus. And somehow, and it's not, I don't leave behind the other stuff that I've experienced when I come back. But it's given a new sort of cogency, a new center. It makes sense in a new way. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 3, he says that I'm afraid for you. That just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, he says, so somehow your minds might be led astray from the simplicity of your devotion to Christ. The simplicity, that your minds would be led astray from the simplicity of your devotion to Christ. The question is, what does this simplicity look like? Because I think that sometimes we can romanticize going back. Man, I just wish I could go back to when it was all very simple. I wish I could just go back to Galilee before all of that chaos in Jerusalem happened. It was just simple. I met Jesus, and I knew him, and I loved him. I wish I could go back to that moment. What does it look like? What does this simplicity that Paul is talking about look like? There's a great quote by the 19th century poet, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and he said this, if you can put the first slide up on the screen. He said, for the simplicity on this side of complexity, I wouldn't give you a fig. But for the simplicity on the other side, the far side of complexity, for that, he says, I would give you anything I have. For simplicity on this side of complexity, he says, I wouldn't give you anything for that. But for a simplicity on the far side of complexity, I would give you anything I have. What is the simplicity on the far side of complexity? The simplicity on the far side of the complexity is something like E equals MC squared. Simple, pristine, elegant, beautiful formula. And yet there's a universe within that. E equals MC squared. Beautifully simple, and yet it contains a whole universe. It's the seedbed for a whole new way of thinking. And the guy who came up with E equals MC squared, Albert Einstein, you had better believe that when he started working with physics, there was a simplicity to it. It's just math, adding and subtraction and division and all that business. 
But then I start getting into it, and I realize that it's incredibly complex. It's bewilderingly complex. It doesn't make any sense to me, and so I keep leaning into it, and I keep teasing apart the equations, and I keep working with this stuff and trying to make sense of it and trying to make it work. And then all of a sudden, there's like this moment where you see it in a way that you never saw it before, and it has this pristine, beautiful clarity. E equals mc squared. The spiritual life, I contend, is like that. That you start following Jesus and you realize, wait, this is infinitely more complex than I ever realized it was. You start, even leaving following Jesus aside for a second, even trying to be a human being. Like, I have this thing that I was saying all last year, because last year was a really hard year for me personally, and I'm going to wind up, like, emblazoning it on my tombstone when I'm dead, that nobody can adequately prepare you for how hard it is to be a human being. It's just hard. Say nothing of trying to follow an invisible God, you know, who you cannot see and you've only really heard about and sort of experienced in some way, shape, or form. And you're trying to give yourself over to this God, yield yourself to this God. It's complicated. And then you have these moments within it where in the midst of all the questions and all the doubts and all the wrestling and all the turmoil, you come back to this, meet me in Galilee. You come back to where it all began. And your faith, winds up not being simplistic anymore, but it winds up being simple because you've achieved that simplicity on the far side of complexity. You did the hard work. You wrestled with God. You wrestled with the doubts. You wrestled with the questions. You wrestled with yourself. You wrestled with the relationships. You wrestled with the strain of obedience. I said yes to you, God. I gave myself over to you. I started following you, and I found out that it was ridiculously hard, but I didn't give up in it. And you find that when you get to the other side of it, that you've achieved a new kind of simplicity, a simplicity on the far side of complexity. What I want to submit to you is that living in resurrection is something like that. That it's less like the spiritual journey is less like a journey where we just sort of mosey on along and then we reach our destination. And I think it's more like a spiral where you sort of go through the same rhythms, just like in the church calendar, we go through the rhythms year after year. And what happens as you go through the rhythms is that they take on more meaning for you. Lent is deeper every time you do it. Easter is deeper every time you do it. The more you live in this with this God, Advent is deeper. The coming of God in the world and all that it means, it's deeper, it's richer, it's more complex, it's more profound, and yet it's also more simple and powerful. And as you keep journeying with this God, what happens is that you sort of ascend up into this place that's beautiful and broad and simple because it's deep, because you've wrestled with it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you with me? Again, not a rhetorical question. All right, that's very good. I need you to talk to me. Now, it seems to me that there are two perils, there are two pitfalls that we need to avoid if we're thinking about this sort of simplicity issue. The first, I would say, next slide, is that we stay in Galilee. That we stay in Galilee. It would have been the easiest thing in the world for the disciples to do, to meet Jesus in Galilee, to hear his call on their life, and then to go, you know what? You go and do all that other stuff. I had my experience with you. It was totally wonderful. I'm going to cherish it for the rest of my life. But please, you live your life, and I'm going to live my life. And I think a lot of us opt for that in our faith. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that you opt for this simplicity on the near side of complexity, this staying in Galilee. One of the ways that we do it is by never wrestling seriously with our faith. And so because of the tradition that we were raised in and because of the pressure that we experienced therein, we have these sort of nagging doubts and questions and things that we wonder about our faith. And nobody ever gave us the green light to ask those questions. And so we go, you know what, those questions are off limits. I'm not going to ask those questions. I'm going to stay back here in this place where it's all safe and it all makes sense. Galilee feels good. That's one of the ways that we do it. Another way I think that we stay in Galilee is by never following the deep yes that God has put in our heart for something that we're supposed to do. And some of you have a deep yes that's buried in your heart. It's either for some ministry or for some mission or for some entrepreneurial idea, something that you're supposed to do with your life. You feel the call of God in your life to do this thing, and everything in you goes, oh gosh, no, I can't do that. And you stay in Galilee. The story stays simple. It stays uncomplicated. It stays in a place that's free of risk and free of doubt and free of uncertainty. And it's also free, I'll just say this to you, of the deep joy that's available to you 
if you give yourself over to this God in a deep way. And so one of the risks that we run is staying in Galilee, and a lot of you have stayed in Galilee. Everything in your life is safe. Everything in your life is totally predictable. You never ask the questions. You never entertain the doubts. You never give God the deep yes. You never take the risks that you're supposed to take, that you know that you're supposed to take. And your relationship with this God, which, by the way, usually looks like risks in terms of relationships with other people or risks in terms of your relationship with yourself, you've never taken the risks. And because of that, your faith is juvenile. And it will remain there until you say yes to this God. So I think one of the perils is that, staying in Galilee. But peril number two, equally as dangerous, is that you never come home to Galilee. And so you say the yes, and you jump into the journey, and you give yourself over to the path of following this God. You start entertaining the doubts or the questions or whatever it is, and you never come back. You just sort of get stuck in this space that's complex, and you never come back to that spot where it all sort of reattains this crystal clarity again. And I think both of these perils, both of these pitfalls are things that we have to avoid. We can't stay in Galilee, but we can't fail to come home. We can't stay in that place where we first met Jesus. It's fundamentally impossible. But we have to keep coming home to him. Leaving and coming home. Leaving and coming home. I think it's a metaphor for the spiritual life. Now in my own life, what I've experienced is that as I follow this Jesus into this life of risky obedience, as I let him lead me out in the journey, what happens to me is that I find that my sense of who God is and my sense of who I am is deepened and broadened and widened and it also becomes much more clear and much more profound. And I think about, I think about even the guy that I was 10 years ago or however long it was ago that I was sitting out here. Um, that guy, that guy was constantly sort of in the fog. I would have these moments and I was simpler then. But I constantly had these moments where uh, I'd think, man, I just wish things could be like the way that they were back then. And God would lead me. Jesus would sort of lead me in this risky sort of journey. And what's happened over the years is that there's this new sort of simplicity, a new joy, a new wonder that's stolen into me. The very interesting thing I think about this God is that when you begin to follow him, what happens is you experience the paradox of growing up in faith. That as we grow up in faith, not only do we get more sort of complex and deeper in our understanding of God, but we get clearer and wiser and more joyful in our sort of giving of ourselves over to this God. Jesus says that unless you change and become like the little children, you'll never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless you change and become like little children. You ever been around a person that's followed Jesus for any length of time, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? I'm talking about those gray-haired types you run into every now and again, and you, you interact with them about their spirituality, and you see that they have, there's like a light in their eyes, if they've been following Jesus for that length of time, that's not explainable any other way, except that they did the hard work of following this Jesus, and he's continued to sort of bring them back to the place of simplicity and joy and wonder. I was shocked about a month ago, uh, I had the unique opportunity with a few friends of mine from Denver to go to uh, Eugene Peterson's house. Uh, You know who Eugene Peterson is? Wrote the Message Bible, famous author, pastor. So we're sitting and we were gonna interview him for this project that we were working on. So Eugene is 81 years old. He pastored for about 30 years and has known Jesus all of his life. And I was shocked because I, like in my mind, like this guy, a couple years ago, he wrote this book called The Pastor. It's like this memoir of his life. So I'm like sitting with Eugene Peterson, you know, The pastor, the guy who like wrote the Bible. And I'm thinking to myself, if anybody, if anybody is going to like bewilder me with their intellect and their experiences, it's going to be this guy, you know? Like I I can't, what I've experienced and what I've lived and what I know, it doesn't hold a candle to what he's experienced in his life. And so we're sitting with him in his living room and I kept sort of remarking in my own heart, I kept remarking at the look in his eye there would be these moments where he would laugh or smile or make some comment, and you would just see this glint in his eye, this light, this bleeding something. And I kept thinking to myself, where have I seen that before? Where have I seen that look before? And I mean, here's a guy who's read everything, who translated the whole Bible, who knows 
just knows so much stuff. And yet there's this glint. And like, I kept thinking, where have I seen that before? And then it dawned on me. The place that I've seen that glint in the eye before is in my children. It's a look of innocence. It's a look of wonder. And it's not an infantile innocence. It's a knowing innocence. An innocence that comes about because you've been in the complexity. You've been in the hardship. You've been in the midst of the dying and the falling apart. You've experienced sorrow and heartache. You've wrestled with it all. And he keeps inviting you back to Galilee. And you've just kept coming home over a lifetime. And I thought to myself, that light that's in his eyes, that's the light that I want to have in my eyes when I'm that age. What I'm suggesting to you is that you don't get there unless you throw yourself into the story with Jesus. You enter the story with Jesus. You say yes to him. You give yourself over to him. And he leads you on that long, arduous journey where all of a sudden it all comes back around. Meet me in Galilee. That's where you'll see me. Let's pray.